It's great to be back again, and today I'm rest, uh, representing the Institute of Construction Claims Practitioners, uh, which is an institute that specialises in educating, training, and awarding recognition for people who have begun to specialise in construction claims. These days it is just like an engineering discipline or a design discipline or a quantity surveying discipline. It is a specialised part of our industry. And we do find that, you know, many, many, many times claims are not handled well from both the contractor's point of view and from the, uh, the engineer's point of view or the client's point of view. And that, well, surprise, surprise, the subject of the talk today uh, can often lead to very costly and time-consuming disputes that needn't have occurred uh, had they got somebody handling the claims uh, uh, from the outset. Just before I start, I'd just like to refer to uh, the fact that uh, the company of which I am a director, uh, we are consultants and we give advice on contractual matters, claims, commercial matters, disputes. We recently hosted our own uh, webinar and we invited as panelists a barrister, a lawyer, uh, an arbitrator, and we had two of our experts that are appointed by the courts and by arbitrators to give expert opinions on, on, on matters of claims. And whilst all of these people earn their money by dealing with disputes, by far, the consensus of the opinion from all these people is the de best way to manage disputes on construction projects is to simply not have them in the first place. So this is going to be the subject of my talk today, prevention of disputes from the outset. Sorry, I need to just make myself live. So what does it cost the industry, your project, your company, when we go to a dispute. Well, Dr. Niall Bunny, who was an internationally recognized expert and, and arbitrator and lawyer at the FIDIC conference a few years ago, uh, announced that he calculated that uh, disputes will cost between 150 and $200,000 a day. So if we have a 10 day arbitration, which is probably about average, we're looking at $2 million just to settle the dispute. Is that good for the project? Is that good for the parties taking part in the project? I think not. And this could actually get up to as far as almost 40% of the value of the claim. So we've got a claim for a million dollars and we're going to spend $400,000 just getting it awarded in our favor. It doesn't make any sense, does it? The DRBF, which is the dis uh, dispute review uh, recommendation board foundation in the states have compiled their own statistics and the cost of dispute may be as much as 10 percent of the project 10 to 15 percent should i say of the project value we've also got these are the the the, the costs that i was talking about there were the costs of hiring your lawyers hiring your experts paying the arbitrators, paying the court fees, da, 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 da. And we can see that the people who are getting rich out of disputes are actually the people who are handling the disputes, the lawyers, the arbitrators, and the rest of it. That's not going to the project. That's not helping the project at all or the parties involved in the project. But we've also got hidden costs, which we can add to those costs which I quoted earlier. We've got employees' time and effort in supporting the lawyers and the arbitrators and the claims consultants and all that. You're taking employee time away from what they should be doing, and that's building buildings, because that's what we're in the business to do. Consultants' time and effort. So you may need to employ people to advise you, people like ourselves at Hewitt Decipher Partnership, to help you uh, prepare your claims or defend against the claims or respond to claims. So again, uh, it's also taking away, if you're an employer, you will employ an engineer on a fitted contract or on other form of contracts, maybe a, an architect or a uh, contract administrator. We're dealing with disputes. Again, it's taking them away from the important job of completing the project. 
It will lead to loss of goodwill. If we start fighting, we're not going to be friends anymore. It could lead by, by, from either the employer, if the employer is a developer or a government department that has got ongoing projects, or the contractor to a loss of reputation. And if you have a reputation as an employer, as one of these people that will be pushing for disputes and not wishing to agree things and, and contesting everything, you will find that contractors won't want to work for you, or if they do want to work for you, they will include a substantial amount of risk when they price your job. So it's going to cost you more if you're one of these bad employers uh, to bring your projects in. If you're a contractor, well, it's not a great thing to be get, gain a reputation as being one of these contractors that constantly puts in claims when they're not really just and, uh, and, and, and uh, submits spurious claims and tries to claim for things where they're not really entitled. So there's this hidden cost as well as the hard costs. So what I want to discuss with you as engineering professionals is how can we prevent disputes from occurring on our projects right from the outset. And if you are working for consultants or the employers, there's an awful lot that you can do even before we select the contractor and even before we sign the contract with that contractor. So let's start right at the beginning. And again, this is aimed at developers, employers, when we are looking to select our consultants on the project, whether this is for design, whether it's for cost control, whether it's for contracts management, whether it's the party appointed to act as the engineer under the FIDIC, it could be the designer or it could be somebody uh, completely separate, such as a, a project management consultant. But the difference between employing the best consultants and poor consultants is really minimal in terms of the project budget. So if we take a project of $10 million, uh, the consultant's uh, cost on the project is going to be around about 10%. The difference between the best consultants and the worst consultants might be 20% of that 10%. So this comes down to absolutely zero in real terms on the overall cost of the project. But if you have an incompetent consultant that you've bought based on cheapness of their fees, that saving will soon, soon, soon be eaten up in mistakes, in badly managed projects, in disputes, et cetera, et cetera. So please, please, if you're in a position to make these decisions, make sure you select your consultants based on quality, on track record and reputation rather than price. When we are compiling the contract conditions, and, and it was great to hear you talk about FIDIC because that's something that I, uh, I know very, very well and provide training on in fact. Uh, so when we compiling the contract conditions or changing standard forms of contract, and it is quite frequently that we will do this. But when we do this, use someone who is appropriately qualified and experienced to do it. So often we get it's the designer who prepares the conditions of contract because he has the responsibility of sending the project out to tender. But it doesn't have a properly experienced or qualified contractual expert on his staff because it's not a thing that they do on a regular basis. So it goes to some guy who doesn't really know what he's doing, who does his best, but because he's not an expert and not properly qualified, we end up with very, very badly drafted terms and conditions of contract. And it's very true to say in FIDIC, if we're going to change some fundamental parts of FIDIC, but it's not necessary to only change maybe one clause, but there are another three or four clauses that, that, that are linked into that clause that need to be changed as well. Otherwise, we have conflicts. And if we have conflicts, we're open to interpretation, and that's a potential for a, a dispute. 
The other thing, again, and, and this is before we, we even go out to tender, is to select the most appropriate form of contract. So if you're in a position to be advising the employer or you're working for the employer, don't just go for the form of contract that you'd used on the last project or the last 10 projects because you're familiar with it. If we're talking about FIDIC, FIDIC has a whole suite of contracts. So let's look at the project. Let's look at the employer's requirements for that project, what his risk profile is, what he wants to spend, if he wants to be have a, a reasonable certainty of the, out, the, the, the financial outcome and, and the time or whatever, and make sure that we use the most appropriate form of contract for the project and the employer's requirements. And let's just have a look. Uh, I'm saying here, many organizations have produced robust forms of contract. In, in many countries, they have their own domestic forms of contract because these have been developed over many, many years. Uh, FIDIC seems to be the default form of contract for countries that don't have this the, these domestic forms of contract. And it's a great contract. In fact, it's a great suite of contracts. It, they, it's been written by engineers for the use of engineers. And whilst lawyers have verified it and made sure that everything is correct, uh, well, it is really an engineer's document. We can have, and, and FIDI, the Red Book, provides a contract where the design's provided by the employer. It, we have design and build contracts, the yellow book and the silver book. We have turnkey projects, EPC projects, uh, contracts in FIDIC. This is the silver book or the gold book. We have design, build and operate, which is the gold book. And FIDIC have created a form of contract for each of these situations. If the employer wants more certainty of time and budget, well, probably an EPC form of contract with the risk profile changed away from the employer and more risk put on the uh, contractor. We've got to realize that this will cost the employer more because the contractor will have to price for more risks or to manage more risks. Uh, do we have a remeasurable or a lump sum price? Everybody seems to like lump sum prices. They seem to think that if we have a lump sum price, that will be the final price. It will never be the final price. This is construction. Things always change. I don't see anything wrong with having a remeasurable form of contract where the contractor is paid for the actual amount that he provides. So if the design drawings say a thousand cubic meters of concrete and he only provides 900 because the designs change, he only gets paid for 900. And of course, the, the reverse is true also. FIDIC have contracts the, for, uh, for, for small works and uncomplicated projects or the most complicated project in the world. The Green Book is specifically designed for smaller projects. And I'm pushing these standard forms of contract because in my experience, if the employer goes for a bespoke form of contract, what's well, a form of contract that he's written or is, is commissioned to be written, or we change the standard conditions heavily away from what the FIDIC, for example, intended them to be. This is a recipe for disaster. And they often tend to lead to contention and then contention will often lead to disputes. So select so number one or number two, Number one, get the right consultants. And number two, get the most appropriate form of contract. So let's have a look at the contract documents. And this is really typical, and, and it is actually taken from the FIDIC forms of contract. So we start with the agreement, which is the two pieces of paper that the executives of the two companies, the contract and the employer sign. We have the appendix to tender, which contains the project specific details such as the commencement date, the completion date, the uh, period for uh, defects liability, the delay damages, et cetera, et cetera. We'll then have the general conditions, which in FIDIC terms will be the red, yellow, silver, gold, whatever book. We'll then have the particular conditions, which will introduce any changes that the employer wants to the general conditions. 
We then have the specification, which tell us the quality of the works. We'll have the drawings, which will tell us the extent and the design of the works. We'll then usually have a bill of quantities, which breaks down the price into its components. And then we will have what FIDIC calls other documents. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The contract documents themselves need to be compiled and signed as soon as possible after agreement has been reached. So we go out for tender, we then maybe negotiate with the lowest tenderer or, or, or tenderers, and we will negotiate some conditions, we will negotiate, maybe renegotiate the price, whatever we do, and then we enter into an agreement, usually by uh, the issue of a letter of award, uh, and then we have to follow up with the contract documents. And it is important that these contract documents should be put together and signed by the two parties as soon as possible after we've reached that agreement. Now, why is it important? Because we need a baseline to reference the project. If something changes, we need to know what was included in the original price. And if we don't have a set of contract documents, that are designated as, as contract documents in two, three, four, five years time when we're at arbitration and we don't know what the contract documents were, we're in a big mess. Now, when I say this should be signed as soon as possible, what I don't want to do is say that that should be at the cost of preparing good quality, accurate contract documents. Because, what happens is we go out to tender on the tender document. During the tender period, we can issue revisions to those documents, tender bulletins. We can have inquiries or requests for information from the tenderers and the engineer or the designers will respond to those inquiries and make uh, clarifications, sometimes make changes, sometimes issue additional documents. We will also have these meetings with the uh, successful contractor where maybe some points have been negotiated. So the contract documents are not the tender documents and they need to be changed so that they include any changes that have been made through all this, the, these things during the tender period. So if we've issued additional drawings during the tender period, those drawings need to become contract documents. If we've changed, I don't know, a, a section of the specification during the tender period, the old specification needs to be taken out and the new specification needs to be put into the contract documents. If we've negotiated changes to the contract conditions during the negotiation period, we need to amend the contract conditions. Now, that's the correct way to do it. What, and I'm sure you've come across it, because I've come across it many times, is the easy way out, the lazy way out, the non-professional way out, is to just get all these documents, tender bulletins, requests for information, responses to uh, the tenders, meeting minutes, letters, and put them in a big file and stick them at the end of the tender document and say, these are the other documents. Now, why is that bad practice? It's because if the engineer who is handling the procurement goes to the specification and sees specification revision zero for a particular point, is he going to work through that file of other documents to, to, to research, to investigate if something's been changed before he places the order? And the answer is no. So this is a, a, an ideal example of how mistakes can happen because the person or persons compiling the contract documents have not acted professionally. And really this next bullet point is I've already covered it. So the other document section of the contract document should be maintained for things like geotechnical surveys, environmental surveys, things that are useful that we need to include in the document, uh, the, the contract documents as additional or supplementary information, not instead of 
the contract documents that have been changed since they were issued as tender documents. We should have a control set of contract documents on site so that whoever's on site uh, can refer to them and find out, well, what did we sign up for? What are our obligations? What should we be building? When we have a lazy person who's put the contract documents together, it's very good practice to control the risks of a badly prepared set of contract documents by going through them and making notes within, I'm not saying the originals, but a copy of the contract documents, making notes in a controlled copy. So if we've got, we, we turn over to uh, specification 38, and that's been revised during the tender period, a big line across it saying, revised, please see revision A included in tender bulletin three. So that engineer, when he goes to the specification, is going to immediately know that he should be looking at a later revision. So there we've covered things that right at the beginning of the project. And once we've started the project, one of the first things that the contractor needs to do is create his program, which is often uh, referred to as the baseline program. And most forms of contract, and, and FIDIC is no exception, uh, require the contract to submit a program within a certain time frame. And FIDIC says it's within 28 days. Now, depending on the project, 28 days may be reasonable to produce a realistic program. And we've got to bear in mind that at this point, the contractor is probably mobilizing. <clears throat> Has he got a planner on site? Has the planner had time to study the project? Does he have time to speak with the engineers? Is he just a keyboard jockey that can operate Primavera? Or is he actually somebody who knows how to build things? It, it, it happens. Uh, so if it's a complicated project, well, 28 days is not enough time for the planner to sit with his subcontractors who may not have had their contracts awarded yet, get their input, talk to his suppliers to find out when things can be delivered, long lead items, etc. So 28 days on a complicated project is, is really not sufficient. So we need to speak to the engineer and say, look, within 28 days, I can give you either a high level project uh, program for the whole project, and then we will update it when we've got the necessary information. Or we can give you a three month look ahead and then with the rest of it being on a high level. And again, once we've got our subcontractors on board, we've spoken to our suppliers, we've placed our orders, we've decided how we're going to build the project. Yes, we'll give you a fully detailed program. So if you're on the other side of the fence and you are the engineer, please be realistic about what the contractor can actually do. And please don't be one of these engineers that keeps rejecting the contractor's program when there are good reasons why he cannot physically produce a fully detailed program within 28 days. I would say, and I have been a, a, an engineer on both sides of the fence, uh, I would say, uh, let the contract work with the contractor, agree that we can have a three month look ahead with, uh, within 28 days, but within another month, I need something uh, to take me to the end of the project in a lot more detail. Why is this important, this baseline program? Well, for, apart from the fact that it, uh, the contractor needs a plan to manage the project, so he knows what he's going to do and when he's going to do it, and the other parties to the project need to refer to that plan as well, it will also become a yardstick against which to measure not only delays, but also progress. On a monthly basis, we should be able to look at the program. We should be able to change the planned activities that have already been carried out into as-built activities with actual start and finish dates. And then the programming software will tell us when we are expected to complete. And once we've got that information on a monthly basis, are we on track? Are we falling behind? We can find out why we're falling behind. And this is how we monitor things. But it also becomes essential if we're talking about uh, extension of time claims. 
The other thing is that the programme should reflect the intentions of the parties at the time of contract. Many, many times, and particularly when the, the contractor has been slow in producing his first programme, we may be three months into the, the, the project, contractor submits his programme, and the engineer says, ah, ah, no, you were late getting handover of the site, so that needs to go into the programme. We've given you three variation instructions, so they need to go in the programme. Uh, no, no, no. The initial program, the baseline, should reflect what was happening at the time of contract, before the late handover, before the instruction for the variations. Fine, these things have happened. So what happened uh, is that we can then, once we've got the baseline nailed down, we can then revise the program to take into account the late handover and the variations, but that is no longer the baseline, it's a revised program. So engineers, please don't attempt to pressure the contractor in, into including things that have happened after the contract into the program. And if you're a contractor, you are entitled to resist those requests and say, yes, I'll give you a revised program, but we need to get this one nailed down first. And really, this is what I've, uh, I've alluded to already. So should circumstances affect the program, we've got additional work. If we've decided to go about it differently as the contractor, we've thought of a, a faster, better, cheaper way of building the project. If there have been delays or if extensions of time have been awarded, the program always needs to be revised. Uh, and extensions of time, which I mentioned earlier. So we've got our baseline. We've got our revised program because after six months, things have changed. But we also need to monitor progress and we need some basis of measuring the effect of delays if we have an extension of time situation. So we should be producing programs on a regular, and FIDIC says with your progress report, an updated program on a monthly basis. And an updated program, or we can sometimes call it an as built program, records the actual progress up to the day to date of the, of the update and will predict the events after the day to date of the update and consequently predict the time for completion. And as I said earlier, this is how we monitor whether we are falling behind, whether we're okay, whether we're about on track. And this allows the contractor to take mitigation, uh, mitigation or recovery uh, steps if he's falling behind. It also allows the contractor to identify, okay, we've lost a week in this past month. Why? And the planner says, well, because I've included all this additional work that we were instructed by variation number four. Okay, in that case, we need to start giving notices to the engineer and we need to start thinking about compiling our extension of time claim for that variation. So it's very, very important that we do these updates. And it's very, very important that we should make accurate updates and tell the truth. Now, many contractors will do their updates and the planner goes and tells the project manager, uh, we're now showing we're going to be 45 days late. And the project manager says, mess about with it, uh, massage it and, and make it look as though we're going to finish on time. Because when I go to the progress meeting, they'll shout at me if we predict and it's going to be 45 days late. That to me is a fairly weak a very, very unprofessional project manager, a good project manager, I'm talking about the project manager for the, uh, for the contractor here, will accept the truth if it's accurate and will then take steps to find out why we are 45 de days de uh, late. If it's our fault as the contractor, I need to do something about it to recover my own delays. If it's something that's attributable to the employer, well, we need to start doing what the contract says we need to do, submit notices, submit claims, and apply for an extension of time. If we massage the truth, we will not identify delays. We will not identify the cause of delays. 
we will not enable mitigating action to be taken or identify the party responsible. If we go to the engineer and say, right, we've, we've now got a delay, and, and you're through a notice, give the engineer a notice, the variation instruction that you gave us is going to delay the completion date. And we don't give that notice because we don't really know what the delay was caused by. Well, we are removing the employer, the engineer's ability to mitigate that and say, hey, we didn't know that that variation was going to affect the completion date. Let's not do it or let's do something else. So we are reliant on the contractor to give this information. And if you're not doing your progress updates, you'll find it rather difficult to do that. Or if your program updates are not accurate. We need accurate progress updates if, for if we need to demonstrate an extension of time. It's, very, it's, it's a weaker extension of time claim if it's not based on progress at the time that the delay started to have an effect. Uh, the, the employer needs to know if the, the completion date is going to be delayed. It's a hotel. It wants to start putting people in the hotel, selling, selling rooms. Uh, if it's going to be late handover for, for good reasons, he needs to know about that. He may be expecting to pump oil through a pipeline because it's got a refinery waiting. If it's going to be late, he needs to know about that. Let me just go back to that and, and, and from, from experience is as consultants, we're often brought onto projects when the contractor's in a big mess. He always leaves it too late. We get in towards the end of the project. Uh, he realizes it's going to be late. He realizes it's going to have hefty delay penalties applied and he's not done anything about submitting extension of time claims. So he comes to us and expects us to be magicians and preparing some extension of time claims and one of the first things uh, that we will look at is well what was your progress at the time when all these things happened and on numerous occasions we look at the progress reports and we look at the monthly updates and it says no delay no delay no delay no delay no delay and now we say mr contractor you've been telling the engineer for the past six months there is no delay to the project you're now telling us that you're going to be three months late and you want a three month extension of time. It's going to be rather hard for us to convince the engineer that after six months of reporting no delay, you're now asking for three months extension of time. Had you reported accurately, it would have put you in a much stronger situation. So, my old boss, Roger Knowles, who was my mentor, uh, many years ago, before I became a claims specialist, uh, I went to one of Roger's seminars, and because I can't think of a better way of putting this, I'm going to steal this from Roger, and I'm going to use the words that he used. The three most important things in preparing a claim or a response to a claim are, number one, good records. Number two, good records. And by now, you can probably guess what number three is going to be. Yes, good records. Without records, you cannot prove what happened. And I'm talking to engineers and contractors here, or, or contractors and engineers here. Contractor needs records to prove what is stating in his claim is, are, are true, and they are facts. Engineers need records to back up their responses to claims if they are disagreeing with the claim, either in principle or in detail. So what types of records should we have? Well, correspondence, meeting minutes, submittals, method statements, daily, weekly, monthly site reports, what was going on on the project, material deliveries, plant returns, labor returns, progress photographs, program updates, Etc. And, and you know, I don't need to dwell on this. We're all construction professionals. You, 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 all, you all know what this means. Uh, what I would say, my advice is, emails are absolutely fantastic for day-to-day -day communications. But that, that that's it. They are day-to-day -day communications. When we have important matters, 
when we have things that need to be recorded, that need to be understood by an arbitrator in three years' time, take them off emails and put them in writing in the form of a letter. You can summarize maybe a string of 10 emails, if it needs to be, in, in a page of a letter, but that becomes a much stronger record. And more importantly, it's a lot easier to deal with than a string of emails that we're talking about. Hey, how was the golf at the weekend? How's the kids? Oh, by the way, we don't, we're suffering a bit of delay because we didn't get those drawings. Oh, fine, we'll get you the drawings tomorrow. Do you want a game of golf next weekend? You see what I mean? So take the informal co uh, communications and formalize it by putting it in the form of a letter or formal document. Notices. For you contractors out there, this is born from many years of experience, hands-on experience on construction projects. Failure to submit notices of claims on time and in the correct form is one of the most frequent mistakes made by contractors and one of the easiest defences to a claim. Contractors tend not to send notices. When they do send notices, they tend to not be done very well. They don't contain the, uh, the, the right information and they're not in the correct format. And that goes against them. So my advice, and in some certain effect, uh, Phoenix's advice, is that good practice says that notices should comply with the following. So this is Andy's advice. They need to be submitted in the format of a letter or another formal document. Not only that, it, they need to state that the communication is a notice. So I, I like to put notices in the form of a letter, but the subject line of, of the letter would be notice of, bum, ba, dum, ba, dum. so there's no excuse. The lawyers in three years' time can say, this is, doesn't comprise of a notice because it doesn't say it's a notice. This in the site meeting minutes is certainly not a notice because it's not even in the form of a letter or a, a formal document. So state that it's a notice. Uh, great idea, well, I, I think it's an essential idea, to contain the reference of the contractual clause that require the notice to be submitted. And I like, you know, people don't like receiving notices very often because it's pointing the finger at them, particularly if the engineers are at fault. But I like to put in my notices, dear Mr. Engineer, as required by subclause 1.9, delayed drawings or instructions, da, 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 da. So what are we doing? We're saying, it's not me that wants to send this notice. We're not pointing the finger, but the contract says we have to do it. We're required. We're obligated to do it. So quote the clause. Clearly describe the events or circumstances giving rise to the notice. Your notice is not sent to the person in the site office across the, the, the way from where you're sitting. It's written for the arbitrators to read in three years' time. So it needs to clearly describe the events that the, the subject of the notice is about. It needs to record the date of the event. Mr. Dear Mr. Engineer, we will need the drawings for section B uh, by next Tuesday. Otherwise, we'll have a crew of uh, resources stood there idle with no work to do. Yeah, so we're recording the, the, the event. Next Tuesday comes, we still haven't got the drawings. Dear Mr. Engineer, as required by subclause 1.9, uh, we are now incurring delay and incurring cost as from next yesterday which was tuesday so we got the day recorded uh, in many cases the contract will not only give you the requirement to submit notices uh, but and Felix no exception although many people don't realize that this is the case notices have to be submitted to a specific address and via a, a means of communication that's stated in the contract and with copies to all parties. Many people don't realize this exists so they don't do it. By all means, send a copy to the engineer, your pal on site that you play golf with at the weekends, but 
the original and the the, the uh, thing uh, the uh, the original notice needs to go to the engineer's head office maybe the employer's head office maybe and it may, need, needs to be delivered by mail or by courier or by Sometimes I see contracts that still ask for it to be submitted by fax. You know, how old are these things? When did somebody last revise these and update these things? So make sure that you comply with your obligations because this is the sort of thing that the lawyers wanting to buy themselves a new Mercedes will pick up on later in a dispute and say, no, you didn't submit it to the head officer's address and it wasn't uh, submitted by uh, a, a motorcycle courier wearing a red jacket, therefore it's not admissible. What rubbish. <laughs> this is how the lawyers earn their money. So just make sure that you comply with your obligations. Great management tool, and I guess many of you are actually engineers acting as the engineer on, on, a, quadra, uh, on a project. Make sure that the contractor, or, or make sure that you keep yourself a register of notices of claim so that you can discuss these things when you sit down at your progress meeting or at a, a dedicated uh, meeting to discuss commercial matters or, or contractual matters, because we can track what's happening. We've got a notice for this. You said you're entitled to uh, an, an extension of time claim. Where's your claim? Oh, well, we decided it didn't really have much of an effect, so we won't be submitting a claim. Fine, let's put it on the log. Yes, we're preparing the claim, and it should be submitted next week. Fine, let's make it. So this is managing the project. So whether it's you're the contractor or the engineer, uh, this is what we need to follow. Not only the notice of claim, but... In fact, we'll come on to that when we talk about uh, claim submission, which is the next subject. Claims. Very often, uh, the contractor will keep all his claims until the end of the project. He realises he needs more time because, uh, because he'll, he'll uh, uh, be, have delay damages imposed, but he's not done anything about asking for extensions of the time, even when he's entitled. So... Really bad practice, this. FIDIC doesn't say you must submit your claim within 42 days of the event for nothing. It doesn't make it an obligation for nothing. So good practice, as well as a contractual obligation, submit your claims within 42 days of the event, one claim for one event. Instead of leaving everything till the, the last two months of the project and then submitting one really big complicated claim for six delay events or six other types of events. So good practice, deal with claims as they occur. And really that's what I've said, don't defer them till the end of the project. And again, I, I can never understand the contractor's reasoning here. Maybe he thinks he won't need the time. Well, that's because he's not been taking notice or producing accurate progress updates, isn't it? Uh, or doesn't want to spend the money doesn't have the resources on his team to prepare a claim, doesn't want to spend money on a specialist to help him. So head in sand management, it's never going to work. Uh, and I've alluded to before, separate claims should be submitted for each event. Why? Well, because it simplifies things. If we've got one event, it's a good claim, we've prepared a good claim, we've demonstrated it, we can get an award, easy. If we've got six events in one claim, and two of them are easy wins, two of them are, quite frankly, we'll be lucky if we get this, and another two are grey, well, the grey ones and the difficult ones are going to help hold up an award for the easy ones. Plus, it makes the engineer's job harder dealing with one big complicated claim instead of six simple ones. And he can say, well, that's, yeah, you're right on that one. I agree. Here's an award. Here's an award. Not sure on this one. Let's just sit down and maybe ask for some information and, and let's talk about it a bit. This one, absolutely no way, because, because, because. So it's easier to manage from both sides. Quality of claims. One of the biggest causes of disputes is what's known as inadequately expressed claims. So what this means is 
contractor is entitled to something, is entitled to time or money, but he does a really bad job of asking for it. So he doesn't prove that his claim is just. The engineer would be exceeding his authority and going outside his professionalism if he didn't require to be convinced that the claim is a just one. And sometimes it's not totally. Yes, Mr. Contractor, yes, I agree that you were delayed, but I don't agree that you were delayed by the 100 days that you're claiming. I think it's more like 80 days, because, because, because. Or sometimes it will, I don't think you're entitled to anything for this claim, because, because, because. Now, we've got this, this situation where the contractor's actually got a just claim. If it went to a dispute, eventually, after much more examination and investigation, probably the DAB or the adjudicators or, or the arbitrators would find in, in favour of the contractor. But that's after the contractor's got experts, advisors, lawyers, claims consultants to redo his claim so that it does form an adequately expressed claim. So instead of spending all that money on all these extra resources, isn't it better, contractors, that you just prepare a good claim in the first place, rather than waiting for three years and spend $2 million? Yeah? So claims should include an adequate examination of cause, effect, and entitlement, and be adequately substantiated so that the engineer can investigate the matters and come to a decision, whether it's yes or no. So this is what the ICCP about, uh, is all about, encouraging people and training people and uh, promoting good practice when it comes to preparing and responding to claims. And again, in the same way as maintaining a register for uh, notices of claim, we should maintain a register of claims for discussion at meetings. And we should require the contractor to include that with the monthly reports. Uh, so we can say, okay, uh, you, you, you uh, sent a notice that you'll be submitting a claim for additional cost for this variation. Uh, the claim is due to be submitted on this date. Uh, are you on track? Yeah, we'll, we're, we're just getting the last information from the suppliers. We should be able to submit it next week. Fine, great. This claim's been submitted. Uh, Mr. Engineer, uh, you've got until next Thursday to respond to it. Are you, are you, have you investigated it? Yeah, okay. Oh, Mr. Engineer, this claim was submitted and your response is now overdue. When is your response coming? So this is, a, a, again, it's a project management tool. It's keeping on top of things, making sure that we're dealing things rather than burying our head in the sand and hoping that they'll go away, because they won't. Claim responses, talked about this a bit already. Claims should be responded to within the timeframes included in the contract. FedEx has 42 days. Responses should not consist of what I see frequently. After six months, the engineer writes to the contractor and says, dear Mr. Contractor, your claim is, uh, is uh, rejected because you were also in delay, full stop. Is that going to convince the contractor that they should drop the matter when they've got half a million dollars worth of uh, delay penalties hanging over their heads? No, it's not. So it's fine to reject a claim. It's fine to reduce the value of the claim, provided that we say why. So your delay analysis is showing that, uh, you're in, you, that you, the, this event delayed the project by 100 days. We don't fully agree with this because, 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 and we've done our own delay analysis, which shows that it's actually 80 days. So this is my opinion. So what are we doing? We're reducing it by 20 days, but we're telling them why. And then, of course, it will form the basis of discussion and an attempt to reach an agreement. And most of the time, we can agree. But this... Your claim is rejected. I'm the engineer. I can do what I want, but I'm not going to tell you how I've come to that decision. What's that doing? Pushing things towards a dispute. And really, my 
take on the object of a response is to convince both parties because you've not only got to convince the contractor if you're reducing or rejecting his claim but you've got to convince your boss the employer that your findings are accurate and fair and in accordance with the contract so your response documents really saying to the employer <laughs> yes we have to give the contractor additional time or additional money because 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 is it the event happened you caused it actually mr employer the event happened the contract gives entitlement and i've examined all the contractors calculations and i'm happy with them or i've amended them because i wasn't entirely happy with them so uh we need to convince both parties that if they don't agree with our response and they re raise a dispute they will lose Finally, a lot of what I've talked about, uh, sort of outside, a lot of it's just common sense. A lot of it needs a certain amount of specialist knowledge, specialist qualifications, and for you were done it before and got the T-shirt. Now, whether you're an employer or whether you're a contractor, if things start going wrong on your project, a small amount of expert advice, and I'm not trying to sell the services of the ICCP here, or in fact our consultancy practice, but I am trying to give good sound practical advice. Some involvement by an expert, just seeking an opinion or some guidance at an early stage, will often help to resolve contentions before they become disputes. And for example, Contractor's falling behind and he's not quite sure why, but he thinks it's because of this or that, and he thinks is entitled to claim under the contract. Come and have a, a, a chat with someone like ourselves, and we can say, well, actually, we, when we look at your program, uh, the project is actually late because of something that you did. So really, you, you, you don't have a claim. You're going to have to take recovery measures. Or we could say, yeah, uh, it's apparent that there was a delay here. The contract gives you entitlement to claim. You need to think about, first, firstly, make sure your notices have gone in and they should look like this. And secondly, you need to think about preparing a claim. Uh, is that something you can do? Is that something that we can assist you with? So don't be afraid to ask for help. We are People like ourselves are experts, just in the same as you are expert designers, you are expert builders, you are expert engineers, expertise comes in many, many different forms. If disputes do crystallize, so we're getting towards the end of the project and we can't agree on our claims, uh, let's not just let it fester, let's not dig our heads into the sand, let's get the experts in as soon as it starts to, to crystallize. And again, you know, as we said on our panel discussion with the barrister, the lawyer, the, the arbitrator, the earlier people who know what they're doing get involved, the more we can control and avoid the dispute. So expert advice is like anything. Uh, it, it, it is invaluable. So that brings me to the end of my little chat. So uh, if you would like to answer any questions, and I can see we, we don't have a Q&A box, but I can see 11, 11 entries in the chat box. And my colleague, Jen, from the ICCP, uh, is going to help me manage these. So, uh, Jen, what, uh, what do we have, please? Hi, Andy. Well, um, a lot of those are comments rather than a question. We did get a question from Christian. What other option can you do in order to avoid raising a matter onto a dispute board if a client does not want to recognize an event as force majeure, such as COVID-19? Well, this, this is... Uh... <laughs> The client doesn't want to recognize it. It doesn't really matter what the client wants to do. It's what the contract says. Now, he might not agree that COVID-19 constitutes a, a, a force majeure event. This sort of goes back to, well, the, the client may be, have his own opinion. 
It may be right, it may be wrong, it depends what the contract says. But this goes back to why not call on an expert that, that is used to dealing with these things and say, look, what is your impartial opinion? Is COVID under this form of contract uh, something that complies with the force majeure definitions? And if so, what can we claim for? So, you know, he then got the confidence if you're going to pursue a claim for force majeure because of COVID, you are speaking from a, a position of strength and the client's opinion is incorrect. Because if it does go to the DAB, well, the DAB will probably agree with the expert that's given you that advice. And also the other thing is that why don't you go and ask the DAB? The DAB is there to help avoid disputes. So why don't you and the employer go and sit in front of the DAB and say, he thinks COVID is not force majeure. I think it is force majeure. Mr. DAB, please give us the benefits of what you think because you're the experts and, and ask the three wise men what they think. That's what they're there for. Okay. Um... We have several comments and a question from Naboja. I hope I pronounced that close to correctly. If not, my apologies. Um, who says, uh, it appears not to be mandatory to update a program on a monthly basis as per FIDIC GCC. So that, I think that was just a, a comment. Do you agree with that or is? I, I, I... I should have brought a copy of FIDIC. I didn't realise that Serbia was uh, used FIDIC to this great extent. But if you go to, uh, oh, I can't remember the clause number. If you go to the section that deals with the contractor's uh, reports, you will find that the FIDIC says uh, a report on progress. Now, to me, if I had the engineer, I would be insisting that that report on progress Oh, and it also says that compares the planned progress with the actual progress, I would insist on that being an updated program. So uh, I disagree with that, uh, but go and have a look at FIDIC. And if I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember the clause number, but it is the... It has been supplied, the, subclause 4.21. I, I will take whoever's word for it is <laughs> that it came up with that one. But go on, it, it is in there. Okay, and uh, next comment also from the same person. Uh, the form and definition of notice is particularly emphasized in the second suite of FIDIC contracts, uh, 2017. So have you noticed a big change? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and funnily enough, and, and I've got time for a commercial break here. I have written a book about no notices under the uh, 99 <laughs> versions of FIDIC and under the 2017 versions of uh, FIDIC. And obviously, when I was doing the research for the 2017 book, uh, there are many, many, many note, uh, requirements for notices in 2017. In my opinion, this was because people were, uh, contractors were just ignoring the notice provisions from, two, uh, from 1999. But FIDI could be much, much more prescriptive to describe what a notice should look like, feel like, smell like, and taste like. Uh, in 1999, it was very imprecise. So people like us, claims consultants, would say, I know we didn't send you a paper that said this is a notice, but we did tell you in the site meeting minutes and there was an email. So this constitutes a notice. So you can't reject the claim because this is a notice. Uh, not ideal. Uh, we always say to contractors, submit your notices. But FIDI could be much more prescriptive in the requirements for what will be regarded as a notice in 2017. And I think that's a very good thing. Uh, including a notice of claim within 28 days? Yeah, including a notice of claim within 28 days, yeah. Okay, and as a reply to the previous uh, question about it being mandatory to update the program, apparently uh, it is only required to compare the program but not update it. Well, how are you going to compare actual progress against planned program, uh, progress if you don't update the program. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, one, one has got to go with the other. 
if I were the engineer, I would be insisting, and I think I'm well within my rights, is your comparison between actual progress and planned progress needs to be in the form of an update. To be yes. honest, if the contractor's not doing that, he's not doing himself any favours either. Indeed. Um, yes, if anybody is interested, uh, we've done a few things on, on records and record keeping. So, yeah, very important. Uh, and some further comments uh, are that it may be added that uh, a claim is not necessarily a dispute or uh, it's not something bad either. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with you. And, and one of the things I like about FIDIC 2017 in 1999, uh, Clause 20 was dealt with claims and disputes. And I've always maintained from, from the moment I started dealing with claims over 15 years ago that a claim is never a dispute. A notice is not a claim. It, it's a notice. A claim is not a dispute. It's asking for something to which you are entitled to. And a dispute only occurs when we can't agree on that. Now, if we deal with our claims correctly, we, we, we compile them correctly, professionally, and if the engineer responds to them professionally and correctly, it's very unusual that we can't reach agreement. The disputes only occur when either the contractor's not done a very good job or the engineer's not just done a very good job. And we've not convinced the other party that we are right. So uh, definitely, uh, I think it's a good move. Now, FIDIC have, have created another clause. So clause, claims are dealt with in, in uh, clause 20. Disputes are dealt with in clause 21 to separate the fact and to emphasize the fact that claims are not disputes. They are just asking for something to which you are entitled. So a very good comment. Thank you. Yes, and uh, one more question, again, also from the same person. What about the role of the DAAB introduced in FIDIC 2017 in the prevention of disputes? Absolutely brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of anything we can do to avoid disputes. And I like the fact that the, 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 the DAB in 99, the DAB were always there to help the parties avoid disputes. They weren't just there to adjudicate on disputes because in 1999, you could go to the three wise men and ask that question. We think COVID's force majeure. Uh, the other side think that COVID isn't force majeure. Please tell us, three wise men, what is your decision? Well, how can you give us your advice? We've ended off a, a dispute there. But FIDIC have emphasised the fact that they're there to avoid disputes by, in 2017, calling them the Dispute Avoidance and Adjudication Board, or DAB, instead of DAB. Uh, and uh, it's the way forward. Uh, the more we can settle our disputes at project level, and don't forget that the DAB or the DAB are part of the project team, the better it is for the industry. All right, and the final comments again from, and I hope I'm pronouncing it close to correctly, Neboisha. Neboisha, Neboisha Trobojevic. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Um, he said, it would be worthwhile to discuss, however, it may uh, be a time extended one. And I think that goes back to uh, the uh, updated program. And also added, thank you once more, Mr. Hewitt. Great presentation, highly appreciated. Well, so I I, it's, it's always great to be talking to members of ACES. I, I know that you're all thirsty and you're, you're all uh, very, very keen on in, in, in enhancing your professional knowledge. So I've always been made to feel very, very welcome. And uh, with, uh, with, with, with your good grace, I, I will be back again sometime in the future to talk to you again. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the organisers. Thank you for attending and thank you to Jen, as always, for her uh, support and assistance. So uh, I think that's probably it for today. Look forward to seeing you again and look forward to actually coming to, to Serbia sometime in the not too far distant future. Looking forward to welcoming you. 